the business world, building your entrepreneurial portfolio and transferable skills with Dr. Lee Munoz. Stay inspired. Could you tell us about your bassoon and contra bassoon? Um, I, I, it was an interesting process. Uh, I have a 9,000 series heckle, uh, and it was a long process to get there. It was interesting, you know, as it is with everybody's search for the perfect heckle or the perfect bassoon. It takes a while first, I think, for me the, the, to be able to find it. it helped, I had to know what that meant to me, what the perfect instrument was. I went through quite a few instruments and I loved all of them equally. They each taught me exactly what I needed to know and how to, to search for that instrument. Um, but it's a 9000 series heckle. I got it from a then principal bassoonist of the Boston Philharmonic. I don't know if he's still there. Um, but yeah, it was a really great instrument and it was kind of a funny story on how I got it as we all have. This was back uh, when International Double Race Society had the email list serve that was mm -hmm. sent out. Like if you, you wanted to sell something, you send an email and it sent it out to thousands of members at a time, which was both fun and chaotic <laughs> mixed together. Um, and uh, so this was back in the day. I was living in Boston at the time and I was just getting home from a gig and uh, ding the email. And of course it was somebody had just posted, it was 11 o'clock at night. Somebody had posted a, uh, th this heckle for sale and you know like I had and that even back then 9000 series were uh, they were impossible to get so I happened to notice that it was a Boston area code and so at 11 p.m. at night I called the guy I was like he just posted it so let me try calling him <laughs> and so I did and he wasn't even sure he wanted to sell it he kind of just did it on a whim and then he because he, he really loved the instrument and I go well I live in Boston Maybe I can come and try it one day and, uh, and I can let you know if I'm interested or not. And I, I played about three notes and I said, okay, well, this is, I need to figure out how to, to, to get this instrument. And it's, it, you know, like we all, it's, 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 you know, like finding Harry Potter, finding your wand <laughs> kind of moment where the lights came on and it really just suits me. And it's, I'm really fortunate to have it. Um, I, I, I know, I know how <laughs> the privileged I am to own an instrument like it. So I love it. I, I adore it to death and I've had it since 2006 now. So quite a while. <laughs> My contrabassoon is really nifty too. It's a fast system, uh, made by Fox, uh, Contra and it's called fast system, not just because it's fast, but because Arlen fast <laughs> is, uh, the creator of, it's a great last name for this kind of <laughs> Contra. Um, but he created a, a system uh, along in, con uh, in collaboration with Fox and Chip Owen, who was there at the time, um, a system of uh, venting and a way of getting the Contra to play more in tune. And this is the 35th one I, can't, I think it's thir somewhere between 30 and 35 one ever made and I've only actually had it for a year um I had a fast system before which I I sold it was an earlier one in 15 and um they started using professional model wood with it so um I wanted I, I tried a, a standard contra with it on and I knew that I wouldn't want to make the upgrade so um it's great uh you know it's it's just a phenomenal instrument if you've ever played a fast system even it i most bassoonists who are scared of contra or don't you know like know that they don't play contra they try it out and they're like wow it feels like bassoon it's really mm -hmm. that's kind of what is accomplished by the system um it's it's incredible it's wonderful and i really am thankful that a person like arlen fast who is so so smart and so creative and tenacious at finding something that really works better for our instrument um mm -hmm. i'm really grateful for that because i love playing it <laughs> it's such a dream i'm hoping to play it in public soon because i haven't been able to do it because i got it right before the pandemic and yeah it's kind of been a bummer i play a lot of video recordings i'm sorry there's dogs around here <laughs> they, they might be part of the conversation sometime um but no I, I, you know like it's been a bummer not having to being able to really play it publicly but Hoping too soon. <laughs> Could you talk with us about what a music portfolio is and how to build an entrepreneurial portfolio? 
a lot of musicians don't, and I love that this is one of your main driving causes, by the way. I think it needs to be highlighted. I think we need to talk about it more as musicians, mm. the business side of things, because whether or not we want to, we are doing it. We are all entrepreneurs. We are all involved with nonprofits. We are all involved with, the, you know, like, any kind of, it, you just, it's really hard to avoid. Um, even if you're just, and, and there's so few people that only play in an orchestra, right? Even if they only play in an orchestra, it's a nonprofit organization almost all the time. So there's even that aspect to it. So you're a member of a nonprofit even then. But no, the portfolio career is something that I, I guess it's, it's, it's named that way because it's like a stock portfolio where you have a, a whole bunch of different stocks and they all add up to your the value in the end. And you use some things here that give you a lot of money, some things here that give you safety and so you don't have as much risk. And you have a, a diverse portfolio in order to make everything work. And that's kind of what I'm talking about with jobs as well. Um, I kind of lived it uh, because I lived, in a pla I, I lived in a place where I knew I was going to be staying there for a while because that's where my, my stepson lives and he was growing up. And um, there was only one job, which is Dr. Eric Starnberg's. And I, you know, <laughs> like that's one job in the town that I live. So I knew that it, there wasn't a full time job available to me. And I still wanted to pursue my career. I still wanted to pursue my dreams. And I still wanted to not put, hit pause um, because this is where I was living. And I was really fortunate. I, I had a lot of opportunities. I, I mean, I think Nick Custer, I even mentioned privilege. I was very privileged um, to have a lot of the opportunities I had. Some of it was right place at right time. Some of it was making connections, but um, a portfolio career for me in that instance was playing sub musician for the Kansas City Symphony, the opera and the ballet in Kansas City. Um, it was also included playing in some regional orchestras, it included having private studios in three different cities. It included um, teaching adjunct at different universities and it also included selling reads through Go Bassoon. But because of all these jobs, it, it, they, none of them full-time. No, some of them are not even as reliable as others, right? Like adjunct, you know, you're probably going to be teaching at least a class every semester, um, hopefully. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's still not completely, but at least, you know, regularly. With sub-musician, you have no idea when that's coming and going. You, you know, you'd be working so much and then not at all for a long time. But, um, you know, like the, the whole thing, it would add up to a full-time job. It was my job. It was my job for about 10 years. I lived that life um, and just kept adding layers to it really is what I did. Um, and it's really interesting. And during that time, I also worked for like Midwest Double Read Society. I was uh, the treasurer and I was also the web editor for that. So, you know, like I was involved. I had a lot of, you know, we all do this as musicians and don't realize it. This is all part of our job and all of them are entrepreneurial in a lot of different ways. You don't have to necessarily start a business. If you are a sub musician, you are an entrepreneur, <laughs> whether you only, you know, whether you, you, you call it that or not, it's just part of the, the skills that you need in order to go out, you know, and, and the gig economy or whatever, you, you know, we've been doing it for years. It's so funny. They're calling it gig economy now. And I'm like, well, that's been around for <laughs> decades for musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's a good way of making a career and it's a really neat opportunity. And it's mostly taking what you do well, and taking transferable skills, skills that you've learned as a musician. So I did a lot of different things, but all of them revolved around my interest in education and passion of bassoon. And all of them were actually moving towards, you know, eventually having a full-time job if I wanted, or just being able to live this life where I'm my own boss is the other option too, which is really cool. Um, I paid, by the way, as an, uh, with a portfolio career, you can, you can pay, buy, this was before Obamacare, I paid for my own health insurance. Um, I bought cars, I bought a house, all with the income that I was making from lots of little jobs. Yeah. And I think that's a, a skill that we need to talk about more because it does take a lot of effort. It's not a, not a simple thing to do. It does require a lot of work and it requires a, a lot of um, passion and, and drive to do it. And it's something that 
any musician can do. They just haven't really explored all the fullest opportunities. Um, I, I've taught in entrepreneurship classes. Um, we'll talk about career development. And nine times out of 10, I uh, have my students say, they'll like, well, I don't know how to do that. And I go, well, have you done, have you, you know, practice clarinet? Have you taught a lesson? Have you done this? All of a sudden they have all the skills that they didn't know that that overlapped with the jobs that we were talking about. So, um, so it's a combination of different things, but it's, it's really, really interesting to see what you can do. It does take budget and planning just like everything. Um, but you can see if you teach so many lessons a week for this much money, <laughs> and then you have this many sub gig, you know, per year, you can add it up and it adds up to a, a year, an annual salary that, is actually pretty reasonable. Um, part of it was go bassoon. That was that was a definitely the most uh, I think traditional entrepreneurial, if you want, um, mm. as far as starting a business. That's what a lot of musicians associate it. They just don't see them as a sub musician or a freelance musician as a business, and and it really is. It's actually starting your own business when you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, very little difference in how I approach Go Bassoon Reads to how I freelance. Like that's that's mm -hmm. about, there's very little difference in it. It's just a, a, um, a service versus a, a, um, an actual product that I'm selling. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the difference, I think, the biggest thing. Um, and I put a title on Go Bassoon <laughs> rather than Lee Munoz, freelance mm -hmm. musician, LLC or whatever. <laughs> you know, like that's that's kind of what it is. Um, but Go Bassoon was probably the most traditional part of that. And uh, it was, again, all towards Go Bassoon started really because it was to take me to my dream job, right? <laughs> like the reeds are, I mean, I love reeds. Everybody goes, you must really like making reeds. And I go, I do. I mean, but really the reeds are a means to an end of being a good bassoonist, right? That's why I made good reeds. That's why I made a lot of them. And that's why I ended up being able to sell them because they were all towards being a good bassoonist. As a matter of fact, the whole reason to sell the reeds was again, to pay for my own auditions, to buy my own reed tools, um, and then it just turned into also buying a car or <laughs> buying a house or an instrument or, or whatever expenses come along the way. But, you know, like that's really what the, the goal of it was, was to further my career as a bassoonist, not mm -hmm. to necessarily go, hey, I'm going to be a reed maker today. <laughs> Let's open a shop and do that. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting working both in music and working along with business people because we speak two different languages <laughs> and, but they're really saying the exact same thing. Yeah. And that's the crazy part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like brand is a weird thing to use with music because we don't associate that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, or, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see it, it, it to be the trans. I think that's what we need a lot more is a lot more translators mm -hmm. in the, the music and business world so that we can show that there's a lot of things that can help. The arts can help business and business can help the arts as well. It's where it finally stops, you know, like there's, you've crossed the line and somebody, all of a sudden you are a business person, like you really are the whole time. But when you start to do a sole proprietorship or a read company or tools or like how many people this last, like I've been so inspired by this last year and during this, the, the, during the pandemic, like how many people are selling like double read art now <laughs> like just yeah. beautiful beautiful artwork which by the way i buy so much of <laughs> like if you want to know where the go bassoon money is going it's going to buy <laughs> a lot of these products because i am addicted to it and i've seen cool key change those you know wrapped pencils um we have uh just actual art i like paintings and 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 uh, um, laser printed thing like it's just it's so cool and stickers galore <laughs> let me just tell you i have so many stickers now <laughs> how do we keep working towards our career goals without losing motivation and sight of our dreams so as I, I said in the interview it's really important to have a very very specific long-term goals not generic <laughs> not I want to make money as a bassoonist. 
that is too generic. I want something more specific from the students that I work with and from people I talk to about this. Very, very specific. Um, and it's really important because it, 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 you don't have to actually get that dream job to be successful, but it can help drive you to get the skills. It helps you make decisions like, will this help me get my dream job? No. Okay. Or yes, it will. It's a skill that'll help me. So let me do it. So the, I like to think of, I, I usually, when I teach these kind of classes and I teach this concept, you need a mission statement as an artist. What is your goal? What is the effect that you want upon the world? What is the effect you want upon your work, your career personally, and also in your personal life? Like, cause all of those things really need to matter. So you need to figure out what, what is your mission in life? What is it that you um, want to do? And it can be really, I call it, there's, I can't remember what business person, but it's called big, hairy, audacious goal, BHAG. <laughs> we call it in class, Cassie's smiling because she, she took it to class. <laughs> so, but big, hairy, and audacious. And it seems, in, it seems impossible, but it actually could be possible, right? That kind of, th that kind of balance. And by having these big, hairy, audacious goals, um, then you actually get drive to do things. It drives you to do things. For instance, in my case, um, my goal, I shared it just so everybody knows that because it's, it's hard to share your dream, like, because you didn't get it or, you know, like you feel weird about it, but I don't feel wrong about it because I actually like where I am now. I like where it drove me. I want to be contrabassoonist for the Metropolitan Opera because that's where the rock and contrabassoon parts are. And that's one of the top <laughs> groups to do it. Um, like, so, you know, like I would never have said it out loud. I totally was just like most people. I would never have like said, yes, this is what I want to do. I was just like, give me money as a bassoonist. I'll be happy. But internally I was like, this is what I want to do. And it drove a lot of my decisions. So so for instance, the Kansas City Symphony, when they, I got on their sub list, um, it was right around the time where the second bassoonist was having hand surgery and was taking some time off. And then um, they would call me sometimes very last minute, sometimes like an hour before, two hours before. And I had to drop everything and go and take that gig. And that's why I, one of the valuable things I was to the sub list is that I was, you know, going to go do that. And I knew I had to do that because if I wanted to be in the Metropolitan Metropolitan Opera as a contrabassoonist, I had to be playing with the best groups I could. And that was one that was within an hour drive for me. So like, I knew I had to do that, but I couldn't drop everything if I had a retail job like Starbucks or, you know, nothing, there's anything wrong with it. I, I drink a lot of Starbucks, yeah. so. <laughs> but you know, like I knew that I wouldn't be able to maintain that specific thing that was so close to me. And mm -hmm. one of the top thing, groups that I could play with if I couldn't like drop everything and go do it. So I, I, you know, what could I do to make money? And that's kind of at the same time, people were like, friends were asking for my reads for them and their students. And so I started selling them to friends, you know, and not for any, like, I didn't really think about it. I was just, you know, I didn't think of it as a business. I was just like, I have extra reads. Do you want them? And they would say yes. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, I got money for that. Didn't think of how much money I was making or anything like that. But um, so having that goal led to go bassoon reads. Um, and then it led to getting adjunct positions because, again, I could further, you know, keep working my way up. And then eventually when I decided that my long-term goal had changed, <laughs> which was now I, I really started liking teaching because adjunct work was really showing a lot for, for me. Like I like teaching at the college level. Um, and when, when my long-term goals changed, all of the skills that I had learned striving for that one dream job transferred very, very comfortably into my first full-time teaching gig at the University of Missouri. And that was cool. So that's how like, like a, a mission statement, a long-term goal can really set your ways and keep you going and doing, making all the decisions. And then it's okay if you pivot, because I feel like I'm, I'm successful. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm unsuccessful. Um, you know, like I, I feel like all the skills that I've learned along the way, I'm able to pivot and put towards that too. So that's, I think that's, we're scared to really set something down, especially in one place in time right now. What is my dream job? But that's really what I think is good. So having a mission statement for what your portfolio is, um, all the things should fit that in some way, whether it's it's suiting you because it's your passion and it doesn't pay much 
or it's going to pay the bills and help you do what your passion is, or if it's something that's a combination of the both, mm -hmm. um, that all, all of those things in your portfolio should match up with your, your long-term goals. And if they don't, that's when you can start editing it. So really I'm the overall picture, you want a mission statement or a, a, like, you know, a dream, I call it dream job because again, it's that translation from the business world. A mission statement seems so weird to artists sometimes, <laughs> but that's really what it is. It's a mission statement. What's your goal? What's, what are you hoping to accomplish 10 years from now? What, you know, like, what does that look like to you? And very specifically, what does that look like to you? How do you stay creative in the music world? Yeah, Blanca Palooza, just honestly, on, that came out from my business. Honestly, it whole started because I just needed to make a lot of reads. <laughs> and July just happened to be a time where not a lot of people buy a lot of reads. So I said, well, how about I get caught up with making blanks? And so it kept being a challenge and see how many I could make. And then it turned, people started like, following it oh, like on my own personal page my friends and everything and then the then they wanted to participate along too so they started you know and the it just became a thing and then right before the pandemic shut down that's when it became a facebook group because i realized this like we're all in this together <laughs> and we're kind of doing this and it, it sort of happened organically i don't even know like I didn't have a plan when I started <laughs> a lot of these things, like it, it just happens. And it's really reason it got, became so cool is because of the people in it. Like they really, truly made it what it was. I just gave them sort of the tool I think to use to make it so cool. <laughs> um, and I've made so many friends. Um, Martin being one of them. Hi Martin. <laughs> Cause we chatted a lot now through Zoom. Have, we've chatted very uh, much more online through Zoom like a blues than we have in person. <laughs> Oh, like lies. Yeah, we, we're good. We're good Zoom buddies now. Um, but it, it kind of just happens to be a place. And the only goal of Blanca Palooza is just being kind to one another. Um, if you want to take it off, we read making. Most people talk about read making, but it's really just a place to be, have community and be together. So that's yeah, that's definitely become one of my my hobbies, if you will. <laughs> hanging out oh, with my friends. That. It's really nice and making new ones, too. That's been the neatest part is the people I didn't know before Blanca Palooza, right? And now I do. And that's that's been the the neatest part. Just coming together. Some people make like most people come to make reads, but most people end up staying to just chat. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you notice the read making usually slows down <laughs> and and the chatting just happens and, and that's really cool. I really like that kind of community. Cassandra has shared, I've gotten more connected with people I've wanted to meet, but never had a chance though. Um, thanks to the online shenanigans where, yeah, we can connect from anywhere. Lee, I was thinking a question that you um, presented uh, in a lot of our chats previously and would love to ask you, what? Oh, the tables have turned now, have yes. they? <laughs> what is a class that you wish had been offered in school? I'm old enough that video editing was very in its early days, let's say. I remember making a recording of some, oh, Bassoon Christmas in like 1994 or five and wanting to put it on a CD. And I think it took me and a friend of mine who was a composer slash music tech person about eight hours to get the recording <laughs> from my Dolby kit tape recorded <laughs> version to the CD. <laughs> like, I, like, so I, I, yes, I would have loved to have music tech classes back then, but it was still in its early, it was still a very highly specialized field back then. It wasn't as easy to do as it is now or as accessible. I think it's not easy, but as accessible as it is now. Um, it's a course that I really, I don't know if I would have taken, but if I could go back and kick, you know, stubborn teenager only in the butt <laughs> and take would have been a finance class for mm -hmm. specifically targeted to artists, because I think that's, that's, we have a lot of things that, um, Ooh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Michael Burns says mine involved carving into stone tablets. That's ancient recording. You, you had a lot of chiseling to do to do back in your day. <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, no, I like, I really wish I could have taken a, a an a accounting class and uh, some kind of finance class for, specifically tailored to musicians because I, I've, 
I've sat in, I haven't actually taken an accounting classes since then, but they still don't really cover what's specific to musicians. I think money courses are great for students. I think they should be a gen ed requirement, like writing and what is it like algebra or pre-calc that they make them like in all the universities, they have these general education courses in the United States. Do taxes, all of our, it's all of our freelance, you know. Right, like how to read tax code, where to find it and how to understand it. Yes. Because I had to do it for my business. Like, because I was cheap in the beginning. I didn't want to spend any money on an account, which was, again, dumb, but that's okay. (laughs) I've learned since that was not a smart idea. But it it mostly just because it took me much more time than it cost, you know, would cost me in money to it for an account. But uh, no, like, so I read tax code. (laughs) And like, for instance, as a musician, we need to know what the hobby loss rules are in the United States because the, the, uh, the revenue IRS, they actually... The accountant is also a write-off. Yes, you need to know things like that, right? <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> um, the, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the hobby loss rules in here is if you don't make money in whatever your business is, so say you're a freelance musician and you don't make a profit because of all your costs outweighed the income that you have, even if you have another job, say at Starbucks, um, and you're making money that way, um, but if your write-offs as a musician are greater than that, um, more than three out of every five years, you're considered considered a hobby now by the IRS, and you're not allowed to write those things off. And then you owe all the taxes back on it. And so many, I mean, about every five years, the New York Times does an article about someone who just totally just like blew up because they didn't realize this on some freelancer in New York. And it's always a huge, it's a huge deal. And if you don't know about it, you can't do that. Cause sometimes all it takes is not writing off so much, right? You know, like this year I'm not writing or I need to really push to make a profit this year or, you know, like that, just be aware of it is all it takes, but nobody's teaching that to you in college. <laughs> you know, like that's really important. It's a huge, important deal to us as musicians, especially right out of college, right? It's not, you know, once we get our full-time jobs or dream jobs that we're aiming for, but right out of college when we're working like the Dickens to, to get any penny that we can in order to, to reach the top, you know, like we're just trying to stay afloat to pay for the house, pay for housing, pay for food, and hopefully whatever it'll do to get you to that next gig, right? That's essentially how it feels, at least felt to me. Um, and if you like, you're not aware of these things ahead of time, you need to do it. So I, in every class that I've, I've taught every entrepreneurship class I taught, I bring in a section of tax code and it usually, yeah. <laughs> Cassie, what was your experience when I made you read tax code? <laughs> tell, tell, share for the group. You have to get on the spot. I don't feel like I was reading it at all. It's just so jumbled and foreign and awful. <laughs> But it's what once you understood it, it wasn't that scary, right? It was like more of just getting over that hump of understanding it for the first time, right? Yeah. Yeah, having someone guide you through that made it much more helpful than reading how to go through those forms and, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and understanding that you still have to pay taxes on all the lessons money that you're collecting, like that is owed to the IRS. You still, that, all of that money is still going to need to be like, there's still a percentage that you have to pay to the IRS and, and things like that. You, you, you can really hurt yourself early on. And even if you do pay for an accountant, you won't actually like know what to tell them or what to save ahead of time, like or they'll give you all the bad news at once at the end of the year, right? <laughs> You're scrambling to pay your tax bill. And, and, you know, it's really helpful to know these things up front. And so I wish I had taken, so, like I said, I don't know if I would have as a student, I was, I was a, a free spirit. <laughs> Let's say that at Overland. <laughs> I fit in well, <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, like I, you know, I was a free spirit there. I don't know if I would have taken something as like, you know, like, you know, straightforward as a, a, a math class or financing and things like that. But that's really what I want. I, I think that it should be mandatory for every student, um, specifically musicians, anybody who wants a job that's, you know, associated with gigging, um, which there's a lot of them out there, like journalism, for instance. So, you know, a lot of journalists get their start as, as freelancers and they need to know these things. <laughs> like it should be, it should be as important as being able to write a paper and, 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 and as well as being able to do math. <laughs>
I wish I could go to your class, Lee. <laughs> I don't even teach it anymore. I, I mean, I teach it to, it's, 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 it comes out in lessons a lot. <laughs> and, and which is honestly how I got a lot of it. I was very fortunate um, with people like Dr. Stomberg was very willing to share how to write a resume and how to how to write a CV and how to do cover letters and teaching a lot. Like it was really great just because it, it was, it's, that's how it needs to be passed down, but not all teachers one have the time or the skill set necessarily to teach that, or even the awareness that it needs to be taught. So having a class kind of takes the way, that's what I saw in my job as an entrepreneurship coordinator at University of Missouri was that I was taking the weight off of them. That like there's the students come to them with questions and they're overwhelmed as teachers, which as applied faculty, they can very easily be, um, it, they can send them to me and I can help them with that. I can, I can carry, bear some of that weight so that they can really come concentrate on the best interpretation of whatever piece the student is working on at the time and how to do perfect articulation and vibrato and whatever they need to do in order to be successful as musicians. And how to make the most of it too. That's the other thing is a lot of people are doing it. They'll be teaching like, for instance, sometimes what some of my classes would be around like uh, building your own sole proprietorship, whether it be a fictional or actually a realistic one. And how, like, you're not just teaching lessons. Why, if there are three other clarinet teachers in town, just using as an example, <laughs> three other clarinet teachers in town, why are you the one that the parents are going to, to, to come to? Why are you the one that's, what makes you different? What are you going to offer different from the other teachers? And it, and it can be, yes, you're a very good teacher, but it doesn't always work that way in real life that, you know, the best people, it, it's also other things. What can you offer? What makes you different? What makes you stand out? And, and how to make you the, 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 person that everybody wants to come to. And, and that's, that's a really an important skill to, to learn as well. And tying in with, we were talking about terminology where with the brand, like if you are the teaching brand in any business model, you always have a vision, your mission, your values. Yes. Yes. You know, and so by also doing that for you as an, as your brand or an individual yes. helps give imperative direction. Not enough musicians take time to do it. Some of them do it without even realizing it. Like I'll be talking to someone and they don't realize they have these things already in them and they just needed to, to they just need to put a label on what they are. Um, but there, but there's others that are doing it without the, that information. And that's when you can not be as, that's when you lose a lot of opportunities because you're not uh, really clear in what you're doing. Um, clarity and mission is really, really important. Michael has shared when Lee was talking about needing to have a mission statement, a dream job. I love that new label, a dream job. Um, dream job. I have never heard of a college teaching career in Bassoon while in New Zealand. Yeah, it that. doesn't exist there. Yep. So I had a big pivot at the end of my master's to then pursue my DMA and end up in this job. You, you, you have pivots like a, yeah, it, things change, but the probably the skills that you were learning went right into the DMA, right? Is that that's something that that happened a lot, I would guess. Um, that's, it, it's, it's really interesting to see what it can accomplish. Um, you can pivot at any point. And that's the, the thing. I think that's why a lot of people are a little concerned about doing it. That, that's the thing. I think people are really, especially younger people who haven't really started their careers yet are just getting started. They're scared to label their dream job because they're afraid it'll box them in or limit them or they'll become a failure even because they didn't achieve that. And that's the last thing that happens. <laughs> like, honestly, it, it's, it's more likely to happen if you're not having that mission statement, if you don't have that direction. Um, I mean, think of how many things we do as artists just because we love bassoon, right? <laughs> like our passion is like, we love bassoon. And so that guides us to do things. So if you can even place even more direction on it other than love of bassoon it's incredible what you can accomplish and like i said i don't feel any more you know like i've lit i'm really fortunate i'm like really going to step into my dream job next year yeah. uh, i'm so excited um and like 
you know, like, I don't feel unsuccessful because that's not the Metropolitan Opera, let's just say that, you know, like, I feel I absolutely, like, it's not like, I, I know, like, I don't even think, you know, college age me that had that dream would have, have thought of that as unsuccessful. So keep that in mind. I think the reason I'm here and I is because of the direction I gave it. And again, some people are already doing it without labeling it because they don't have that translator to say, this is what that is. Um, and there's, but there's others that I see that just need that direction and need to also take that risk. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing is it's, it is a risky proposition to, to put it out there and say, this is what I'm going to do, especially if it is something in the today's music, you know, world, it's a, it's always a risky proposition just because the jobs are out there, but they're, they're hard to get. This was a question from Nicole Haywood the other week where she asked like, what do you, what do you wish you knew in your twenties? Honestly, I'm not sure I, I would have chosen bassoon had I really honestly thought about I'm going to be practicing scales every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> I don't know if I fully thought through it. I'm glad I didn't because I do enjoy practicing scales then. I don't know if that's something. But no, um, I think this is really strange. You know, I, I wish almost, and it's going to come sounding weird, but I, I, so I don't know how to put it into words. I wish that I knew I was going to be okay and I was going to... Oh have you know like make a job in music I almost wish I had that I don't know as stu you know like I, we talked a little about how stubborn I was and I the reason I did it was because I didn't think I could <laughs> and so but so but I almost wish that I had sort of a, you're gonna be okay <laughs> like you know like it's okay it would have helped some of the harder times like you know especially when I a lot of the self-doubt crept in you know I wish that I could go back and talk to myself back then I still have self-doubt, by the way, that hasn't gone away, but it's it's now of more of something that I can manage myself and I've learned to, to, to work with, but I really wish that there were some times that I wish you could do it, <laughs> you know, to say it's going to be okay. It, it might take a lot of work and it's going to be a long time from now but you're going to, you're going to do it. And like I said, maybe stubborn old me would have said, okay, well then I don't want to do it. <laughs> Who knows? I was really backwards back then. <laughs> I kind of am now too. I, I kind of like to, somebody says I can't do something. I'm like, let's try it anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that, Martin. That's really, really great. Martin says that I have my current job because people along the way said I can never make this in a career. I've been told that I think we all have at some point. And, and honestly, you know, there's people that, that say that, and, um, you know, they, sometimes they think they're, they're helping you. <laughs> and I, you know, like it's hard. And I think I understand that point of view now. I understand, um, that point of view more than I did back then. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of like <laughs> what you do for your real job. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you how many non bassoonists, non musicians are fascinated by making reads? I have sat around like just drinks at a bar with some of, you know, my work call, like, you know, like my, my husband's work colleagues talking about, re they want to know every detail. <laughs> And I'm like, are you sure you want to hear this? Like, this is not drinking conversation, but maybe it is. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it leads me to drinking, but no, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, like this, you know, like, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah. What, you know, and it's, it, and even though my parents really loved music and like I said, they, they really adored it. Like they never, they, they didn't understand what a job was in music and, you can't really describe that to them because I didn't know either. <laughs> like I really didn't know. Um, so that's always something. So I wish I could go back to me and say, you are going to do it. You don't, I won't tell you, I won't give any way secrets what it's going to be or how it's going to go, but work your artist and just keep going. And that might've saved me a, a few or a hundred weepy days of just yes. trying to figure out if it's ever going to work out. I want to share this because we, we talked about transferable skills and I just, I just remembered I never shared this to you. So the University of Missouri gets this question a lot. Like, what if my student doesn't decide to do music? What can they do with it? So they actually made a graphic. Oops, let's see. There it is. So this is a really cool graphic and it's just this, like the, the start too. This is like, this could have gone on for eons and pages and pages and pages, but 
all of these transferable job skills, this is kind of visualization. I love this, this thing. I share this a lot. I've seen it up in a lot of music schools too. They've, they've taken it and they've laminated it and put it up on their boards because it's a question that we get as teachers. Like, I mean, that's something, what, why, why would I pay for an education in music? There's no jobs in it. And they don't understand that there's so many things that they have transferable skills. And yes, not some of these do require extra training, but they're using, you're a skilled worker for that extra training because you have a music degree. Um, I've also read somewhere that masters of fine arts are greatly, higher greatly valued right now than for Fortune 500 companies than um, masters of business because they, we've lost a lot of innovation through the years. Like innovators come from creativity because we, I, and not, nothing wrong with pushing STEM. I'm a, I am coming from all science and tech people in my family. So there's nothing wrong with a science or a technology uh, engineering background, but we've lost a lot of the innovation because we have not valued as highly the creative degrees that we have. And um, they're, they hadn't been as valued by say fortune 500 companies for a long time and that's changing which is good because it's becoming they're noticing that that is a lack of what they're they're needing and so also people that have music degrees and combine them with business degrees are like huge boon for a lot of companies um, because they're translators right we talk about this translation between business and arts and we need a lot more translators out there um, we were working on an arts administration degree at the university of missouri because again there's such a need for translators and that's a really big deal um, I, i've never used the word translator before though so but it seems to be like exactly the right word um, uh, yeah, so uh, Michael Burns asked, when you were talking about needing to have a mission, oh, no, this is, okay, this is an old one. Oh, sorry. Also to do with the transferable skills, uh, creativity, detail, orientation, self-discipline, ability to work on your own, but the ability to work in groups. Yeah, it's like practicing is something that companies don't know they need, <laughs> the, the skills to practice, right? Um, until they hire some, like, like, for instance, when I worked at PetSmart, all of a sudden I got all these jobs. They're like, go do this for today. <laughs> and literally I can tell you no other like hourly worker was getting that kind of like statement, please go do this. Cause we need this to be fixed. And it would get fixed by the end of the day. That's practicing. I usually like, literally, yes, it was with cat toys and, and litter, <laughs> which is less glamorous than, you know, maybe not less glamorous than learning scales. I don't know, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> like, it really, like, it's the same skills, which was, I need to complete this by the end of the day. These things need to be done to get there. And I need to fix these things before I even start. <laughs> and that's what they would do. And, you know, like, so it's a huge, like, skill that we, we don't know how to sell either. That's the other thing. We are, we don't know to tell our, our future employers, this is what we can do because we don't see it as a big deal because we do it every day. <laughs> it just, we practice what's hard about that you know it's an incredible skill matter of fact a lot of school is about how to practice right it's like like that's like a lot of what my lessons end up being about how to practice this better and i mean that's a really really big deal so we need to be able to also communicate what we are able to do and what we can provide all of those big businesses and those companies um, just from the skills we've learned from even just, let's just say practicing. <laughs> um, Joey said, you're currently a librarian for the public library. So you definitely agree with the graphics. Yes, right? It's absolutely a big deal. I agree. Um, the orchestra rehearsal is the ultimate office space collaboration. We have a CEO, right? <laughs> we have the boss. And then we have all the people that are trying to make the boss happy <laughs> is essentially what, what while also keeping themselves happy along the way, right? That's the whole thing. It's amazing. It's, it really is. And we practice it every day. Like we apply skills that people don't get to apply till well after college. And we do that through our degrees. I mean, that's why it's called applied lessons, right? Applied le things like that. We're applying these skills that businesses are trying to teach their new employees and we're already good at them. That's the thing. That's like, like we might need to have a little like, here is this product that we need to sell or something like that. But we're also really good at selling ourselves. I mean, I mean, think about create coming up with an idea for a concert and how we're inviting people to it. And, you know, like just a junior or senior recital, <laughs> you grab those audience members, get them there, 
all of those things. We have marketing skills and we have all of these skills that are just, we just don't know it. And we don't know how to talk about it with people who aren't musicians either. That's the other thing. We don't know how to say we have these skills. And so a lot of my, a lot of times it's mostly just saying you already know how to do all these things. Now you just need to learn how to talk about them. Is there something new that you've learned recently that you could share with us? I've learned how to buy a house in Kansas City. Yay. <laughs> I'm under contract, which is, by the way, a scary endeavor right now. <laughs> so it, it, literally, houses are getting like 12 offers in 12 hours. <laughs> it's kind of nuts. No, so, no, um, what have I learned to do recently? I've actually been learning a lot about, this is on my desk, so it reminded me, I've been learning a lot about a pedagogy of theory, because I have to teach a theory class next year, and I know theory, I mean, I took theory classes, this is uh, Michael Rogers teaching an overview of approaches of pedagogical and music philosophies, um, and music theory, oh, teach uh, an overview of pedagogical philosophies, teaching approaches in music theory, there you go, it's weird title, but uh, space out here, but it's a really neat book, um, I, I just, I, I, you know, I've studied the, the teaching of bassoon for a while, both, you know, through being a student and also being a, a, a teacher and also by learning from my teachers as well. But I've not, you know, there's a lot of things about theory that are really, you know, like a, a mystery to me. Why do we do these certain things and how do we approach it to a class and how can I make my classes better? So I've actually been learning to be a better theory teacher so that I don't hopefully make too much of a fool of myself next year in the fall teaching freshman theory at UMKC. So that's actually a new skill. And I don't know if it's a skill yet. I'm starting the process though, and I'm learning a lot, which is nice. And I'm, I look, thankfully have picked up quite a few theory friends along the way that are, are very, very uh, um, kind and sharing all their knowledge or at least answering my questions if nothing else. Thank you, everyone.